Hi everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of DockerCon 2021. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Got a great segment here, one of the big supporters in open source, Amazon Web Services. Returning back second year on uh, DockerCon Virtual, Deepak Singh, Vice President of the Compute Services at AWS. Deepak, great to see you. Thanks for coming back on uh, remotely yeah. again. Soon we'll be in real life. Reinvent is going to be in person. We'll yeah. be there. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, John. It's always good to do these. Uh, it's, I, I don't know how, how often I've been at the Cube now, but it's great every single time. <laughs> You're a legend and uh, getting on there. A lot of important things to discuss. You're in, in one of the most important areas in the technology industry right now, and that is at the confluence of cloud scale and modern development applications as they shift yeah. towards, as Andy Jassy says, the new guard, right? It's yeah. been happening. You guys have been a big proponent of open source and enabling open source as a service, creating business models for companies, but more importantly, you guys are powering, making it easier for folks to use software. And Docker has been a big relationship for you. Could you take a minute uh, to first talk about the Docker AWS relationship and your involvement and what you're doing? Yeah, and actually it goes back a long way. Uh, you know, it was in, we announced ECS at reInvent in 2014. And ECS at that time was very much a managed orchestration service on top of Docker. Uh, at that time, I think it was the first really big one uh, out there from a cloud provider. And since then, of course, the world has evolved quite a bit and our relationship with Docker has evolved a lot. Uh, the thing I'd like to talk to is uh, something that we announced with Docker last year. I don't remember if I talked about it on the cube at that time, but last year we started working with Docker on how can we go from Docker Run, which customers love, or Docker Desktop, which customers love, and make it easy for people to run containers on ECS and Fargate. Uh, so most new customers running containers on AWS today start with ECS and Fargate, uh, over half of them. And we wanted to make it very easy for them to start with where they are on their laptops, which is often Docker desktop, and have running services in AWS. So we started working with Docker and that, that collaboration has been very successful. We you know, want to keep, we look forward to continuing to work on evolving that where you can use Docker Compose, Docker Desktop, Docker Run, the tools that Docker customers use, and then be able to run production services on the AWS side, which is a part that we hang our hat on. So I think that's one area where we work really well together. Uh, the other area where I think the two companies continue to work well together is open source in general. Uh, as uh, some of you know, AWS has a very strong commitment to container D, uh, EKS, our Kubernetes service, uh, is moving towards container D. Fargate actually runs all on container D today. And uh, we collaborate with Docker on that, uh, on the OCI specification, because you know the OCI image spec is becoming the de facto packaging format at AWS. Uh, this morning we launched, or well, yesterday, we launched a service called AppRunner. And the main expected input for AppRunner is an OCI image. Uh, we did this with Lambda as well, where the OCI image is now a way of packaging for Lambda. And I think the last one I'd like to call out, and which has been an amazing partnership, and it's an area where most people don't pay attention, is image signing. Uh, there's a project called Notary V2, the second version of the Notary uh, spec for image signing. And AWS, Docker, and a couple of other companies have been working very closely together uh, on bringing that uh, spec, you know, finalizing Notary V2, so that at least in our case, we can start building services for our customers on top of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a great relationship and I expect to see it continue. Well, I think one of the themes this year is developer experience. So good, good call out there and the new announcements on the tools you have and software, because um, that seems to be a great developer uh, integration with Docker. The question I have for you is how should the customers think about things like uh, ECS and versus EKS, App Runner, Lambda for kind of running their containers? How do they understand the differences? What's their, what's the, What's the thought process there? What's the, uh, what's the thinking? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a great question. Actually, when we announced AppRunner, I think that was one of the questions I started getting on Twitter. You know, let's start at the very beginning. You know, anyone can pick up a Docker container and run it on EC2 today. Like you can run it on EC2, you can run it on LightSail, but Docker Run works just fine. It's a Linux machine. Then people want to do more complex things. They want to run large scale orchestrated services. They want to run their entire business on containers. We have customers who do that today. Uh, you know, you have people like uh, Vanguard who runs a significant portion of the infrastructure on uh, ECS and Fargate, and, or you have Fidelity, which is a heavy user of EKS, our Kubernetes service. So in general, if you're running large scale systems, you're building your platforms, you're most likely to use ECS and EKS. Um, if you come from a Kubernetes background, you're running Kubernetes on-prem, or you want the flexibility and 
control that Kubernetes gives you, you're going to end up with EKS. That's what we see our customers doing. If you just want to run containers, you want to use AWS to its fullest extent, where you want the container API to be part of the AWS API set, then you pick ECS. And I think one of the reasons you see so many customers start with ECS and Fargate is, with Fargate, you get that significant ease of use from an operational standpoint. And we see uh, many startups and you know, enterprises, especially security focused enterprises, leaning towards Fargate. But there's a class of customers that doesn't want to think about orchestration, that just wants Here's my code, here's my container image, just run my service for me. And that's where things like AppRunner come, come and that's one of the reasons we launched it. Uh, Lambda is a little bit different. Lambda is a unique service you have to buy into an event-driven architecture. If you do that and you can fit your application into this, that's where you should start, it's magic. Uh, the container part there is what Lambda announced at reInvent where they now support container packaging. So instead of zip files, you can package up your functions as containers and Lambda will run them for you. The advantage it gives you is all the tooling that you built, uh, that you have to build your containers now works for Lambda as well. So I won't call Lambda container orchestration service in the same sense that ECS, EKS, or AppRunner are, uh, but it definitely allows the container image format as a standard packaging format. I think that's the sort of universal common theme that you'll find across AWS at this point of time. You know, one of the things that we are observing at this, <laughs> at this event here is a lot of developers, KubeCon yeah. and Linux foundations, a lot of operators too. Uh, Kubernetes hits that, um, but here's developers. And, and the thing is, I yeah. want an ease, of, ease of use, simplicity, experience, yeah. but also I want the innovation. Yeah. I want all of it. Yeah. When I ask you, what does Amazon bring to the table for the new equation, what would you say? Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, it's always, I'll, I'll, you've probably heard me say this a hundred times, maybe a thousand times, it's foggy. Fargate's unique to us. It's takes a lot of what we have learned about operating infrastructure at scale. The question we asked ourselves, uh, you know, in many ways we thought about Fargate even before we launched PCS, but we had to learn on what it meant and what customers really wanted. But the idea was when you are running clusters of instances or machines to run containers on, you have to start thinking about a lot of things that in some ways VMs, but VMs in the cloud are taken away. Capacity, what kind of infrastructure to run it on, should I bin pack? Should I not bin pack? You know, where is my container running? Those are things you suddenly started having to think about. Those felt kind of backwards almost. So the idea was, how can we make your containerized bundle, so ECS task or a Kubernetes pod, the thing that you talk to, and that is the main unit that you operate on. That is the unit that you get built on and metered on. That's where Fargate comes in. And it allows us to do many interesting things. I mean, we've effectively changed the engine of Fargate since we've launched it. Uh, we run it on EC2 instances and we run it on Firecracker. Uh, we've changed the Fargate agent architecture. We've made a lot of underneath the hood uh, changes that even take that take advantage of the broader innovations at AWS. Uh, we did a whole bunch more to launch uh, AppRunner, which runs on top of Fargate. And customers don't have to think about it. They don't have to worry about it. It happens underneath the hood. It's always you upgrade the engine as you, as you go along. And it takes away all the operational pain of managing clusters, of running to picking which instances to use, figuring out, trying to figure out how to bin pack and get efficiency, that becomes our problem. So, you know, that is an area where you should expect to see us do a ton more. It's becoming the fabric of so many things at AWS now. Uh, and it's, you know, in, in some ways we're just starting. There's a lot more to do. Yeah, and it's a really good time. A lot more wave of developers coming in. One of the things that we've been reporting on, on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE with our CUBE videos is, more developers keep on coming on, more people are coming in and contributing to the open source community, even end users, not just the normal awesome hyperscalers. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about like classic, I call Main Street Enterprises. So yeah. two things I want to ask you on the customer side, because you have kind of two customers. Uh, you have the community, uh, open source yeah. community, and you have ent enterprise customers that want yeah. to make it easier. What are you seeing and hearing from customers? I know you guys work backwards from the customer, so I got to ask you, Work yeah. backwards from the community and work backwards from the enterprise customer. What's going on in their environment? What's the key trends yeah. that they're riding? What's the big challenges? What's the big opportunities that they're facing? And same for the community. Yeah, I'll start with the enterprise. That's almost an easier answer, uh, which is, you know, we are seeing increasingly enterprises moving into the cloud wholesale. Like in some ways, the, you could argue that the pandemic has just accelerated it, but we have started seeing that before. Uh, and uh, they want to move to the cloud and adopt modern best practices. Uh, if you see my talk at reInvent, last few years I've talked about modernization and all the aspects of modernization. And that's 90% of our conversations with enterprises. 
I walk into a meeting supposedly to talk about containers, but about half a conversation is spent on how does an organization modernize? What does an organization need to do to modernize? And containers and serverless play a pretty important part in it because it gives them an opportunity to step away from the shackles of sort of fixed infrastructure and the methods and approaches that built in. But equally, we are talking about CI, CD, you know, fully automated deployments. What does it mean for uh, developers to run their own services? What are the, how do you monitor and uh, uh, instrument uh, your services? How do you do observability in a modern world? So a lot of those are the challenges that enterprises are going towards. And we are spending a ton of time helping them there. But many of them are still running infrastructure on premises. So, you know, we have outposts for them. Uh, it, you know, just last week, we were talking to a bunch of our customers and they have lots of interesting ideas and things that they want to do with outposts. But many of them also have their own infrastructure. And that's where something like ECS Anywhere came from, which is, hey, you like using ECS in the cloud. You like having this API that just orchestrates containers for you. It does it on, on AWS, in an AWS region. It'll do it in an outpost. It'll do it on wavelength. It'll do it on a local zone. How about we allow you to do it on whatever infrastructure you bring to us? Uh, you want to bring a Raspberry Pi, you can do that. Uh, you want to bring your on-premises data center infrastructure, we can do that. Or a point of sale device, as long as you can get the ECS agent running and you can connect to an AWS region, even though it's okay to lose connectivity every now and then, we can orchestrate your containers for you over there. And you know the same customer that likes the ease of use of ECS and the simplicity really resonated, that message re really resonates with them. So I think where we are today with the enterprise is we've got some really good solutions for you in AWS and we are now allowing you to take those APIs and then launch containers wherever you want to run them, whether it's the edge or whether it's your own data center. Now I think that's a big part of where the enterprise is going. But by and large, I think yes, a lot of them are still making that change from running infrastructure and applications the way they used to, to a modern sort of, if you want to use the word cloud native way. And yeah. We're helping them a lot with that. The community is interesting. They want to be more participatory. Uh, that's where things like Copilot comes from. Quite honestly, the best thing we've ever done in my org is probably our open roadmaps, where the community can go into the roadmap and engage with us over there. Whether it's an open source project or just trying to tell us what the feature is and how they would like to see it, it it's a great engagement and you know, it's, it's taught us a lot. It's helped us prioritize correctly and think about what we want to do next. So yeah. and I think that's a great part that, of that's a, That must be very hard to do for opening up the kimono on the roadmap because normally that's the crown jewels and it's secretive and, you know, and um, now it's all out in the open. I think that is a really interesting um, experiment. And uh, what's your reaction to that? What's been the feedback on the roadmap piece? Because uh -huh. I mean, I definitely want to see the roadmap. Yeah, uh, so we do it pretty much for every service in my organization. And uh, we've been doing it now for three or so years. I forget, I think about three years. Yeah. And it's been great. Now we are very up, we are very upfront, which is security and availability are job zero, zero, zero. And you know, yeah. all, 100 times out of 100, if I have to choose between a new feature and helping our customers be available and safe, we'll do that. And which is why we don't put dates in there. We just tell you directionally where we are and what we are prioritizing. Uh, then every now and then we'll put something in there that you know we'll not choose not to put a feature in there because we want to keep it secret until it launches. But for the most part, 99% of our roadmaps out there and people engage with it. And it's not proven to be a problem because we've also been very responsible with how we manage and be very transparent on whether we can commit to something or not. And I think that's helped a lot. I got to ask you on, as a leader, um, uh, threaded leader on this group, open source is super important as you know, and you continue to do it for many years. How are you investing in the future? What's your plan, uh, plans for your team, the industry, obviously and very inclusive, which is very yeah. cool. It's going to resonate well. Uh, what's the plans? Give us some details on what you're investing in. What's your priorities? Yeah. What's your first principles? Yeah, so you know, it goes in many ways. One, one, I, I also have the luxury, I also run the Amazon open source program office. So I, you know, I get the chance to, my team rather, not me, uh, help Amazon engineers participate in open source. They're, that's the team that helps create the tools for them, uh, makes it easy for them to contribute, creates all, you know, manages all the licenses, et cetera. I'll give you a simple example. You know, in there's this thing called the ECR Credential Helper that was written by one of our engineers and he kind of just wrote it because he felt it was something that we needed to do. And we made it open source. In, in general, in, in, in many of our teams, the first question we ask is, should something be open? You know, why is this thing not open source? Especially if it's a utility or some 
piece of software that runs along our services. So that was step one. But we've done some big things also. Uh, I, you know, a couple of years ago, we launched a Linux operating system called Bottle Rocket. And right from the beginning, we, it was very clear to us that Bottle Rocket was two things. It was both an AWS product, but first it was an open source project. We'd already learned a little bit from what we'd done with Firecracker, but making Bottle Rocket an open source operating system was very important. Anyone can take Bottle Rocket, we open sourced our build tooling. You can run it wherever you want, if you want, to take Bottle Rocket and build a version and manage it for another provider, or another provider wants to do it, go for it. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. So you'll see us do a lot there. Obviously there's multiple areas you've seen AWS invest in on the open source side. But to me, the wins come from when engineers can participate in small things, release little helpers, or get contributions from outside. And I think that's where we're still, we can always do better. We're going to continue to uh, strive to make it better and easier. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, I have, you know, me and my team, we have an opportunity to help there with inside the company and we continue to do so. But that's what gets me excited. Yeah, it's great stuff. And congratulations on investing. It's, the community really enjoys it. And I know it moves the needle uh, for the industry. Deepak, I got to ask you while I got you here, um, DockerCon, obviously developers, what's the most important story that they should be paying attention to as a developer? Because a lot's going on shift left for security, day two yeah. operations, also known as AI ops, Git ops, whatever you want to call it, you know, ongoing, you get serverless, you got Lambda, I mean, all kinds of great things are going on. You mentioned Fargate. Um, yeah. What should they be paying attention to that's going to really help their life, both yeah. innovation wise uh, and just the quality of life? Yeah, I mean, I would say, look at, you know, in the end, it is very easy, developers in particular want to build, they're builders, and it's very easy easy to get tempted to try and get, learn everything about something, you know, have access to all the bells and whistles and knobs. But in reality, if you want to run things, you want to, you want to focus on what's important, the business application, the end user application. And I think a lot of what I'll tell developers, and I think it's a lot of where the industry is going is, we have built a really solid foundation, whether it's Kubernetes or ECS and Fargate, uh, or, you know, container registries out there. We have a very solid foundation that you know, our customers and developers all over the world can use to build upon. But increasingly, and you know, we are going to provide tools that sort of take that, wrap them up and provide in a nice package solution. Apron is a great example. Our collaboration with Docker around Docker Desktop are a great example, where forget all the muck, focus on your application and build on top of that and you can get so much done. I think that's one trend you'll see more and more. Those things are no longer toys. They are production grade systems that you can build real world applications on, even though they're so easy to use. The second thing I would add to that is um, GitOps. Uh, it is, you know, you can give it whatever name you want and there's, a, there's nuances there. But I actually think GitOps is the way people should be running their infrastructure. Right? This is my bias and my personal, you know, it's something that we believe a lot in our side is how do you, automate, you go towards immutable infrastructure and infrastructure automation. We think GitOps plays a significant role. I think developers naturally gravitate towards it. And if you want to live in a world where development and operations are tightly linked, I think GitOps has a huge role to play in that. Uh, it's actually a big part of how we're planning to do, you know, things like EKS anywhere, for example. And GitOps is a significant player in that. Take AWS Proton. I think GitOps will be a, a significant player in the future of Proton as well. So, you know, I think that's the other trend. If you wanted to pick a trend that people should pay attention to. Yeah. That's what I believe in a lot. Yeah, well, well, you're an expert, so I want to get you a quick definition. What is GitOps? How would you define it? Because that's oh, a big trend. Yeah. What is it? What does yeah. it mean? Uh, Alexis Richardson will probably shoot me for getting this wrong. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you how I think about it, which is, you know, in many cases, um, you, uh, when you're doing deployments, you're pushing a deployment. A GitOps is more of a full deployment when you are pushing code to a Git, re, Git repository. You have a system that knows that the event has happened and then pulls from there and triggers the thing as opposed to you telling it, hey, I have this new piece of code, now go deploy it everywhere. So to me, a biggest change is that two parts. One is it's more of a pull mechanism where you're pulling because something has changed. So it needs systems like container orchestrators to keep them you know, and to keep them in sync. And the second part is a natural, natural evolution of infrastructure as code, which is Basically everything is code. Config is code, infrastructure is code, code is code, and everything is getting stored in a software repo and the software repo becomes your store of record and drives everything. Um, so for a class of customers, that's going to be a pretty big deal. 
Yeah, when you're checking in code, that's the, again, it's like, uh, you know, a compiler for the compiler, a container for the container, you got things for the, each other. Automation is ultimately what we're talking about here. And that's to me where yeah. machine learning kicks in. So again, having yeah. this open source foundational fabric, as you said, forget out the muck or the undifferentiated yeah. heavy lifting. This is what yeah. we're talking about automation, isn't it Deepak? Yes, I mean, as I said, uh, what the thing where we hang our hat on is there's such good stuff out there in the world, which we, we like to contribute to. But the thing we like to hang our hat on is, how do you run this? How do you do it this in ways so where you can uniquely bring capabilities to customers, whether it's things like Nitro or the things that Nitro opens up, or the fact that we have built up this operational infrastructure over the last uh, you know, decade plus or in the container space over the last seven years where we really, really know how to run these things at scale and have made all the investments to make it easy to do so. That's, a, that's where we hang, hang our hat, keeping people safe, helping them run highly available applications. There are new startup that just completely takes off and over a weekend for whatever reason, because you know, you're the next hot thing on Twitter. And our goal is to support you, whether you are you know, uh, enterprise that's moving things up for mainframe, or you are the next hot startup that's you know, growing virally. And uh, the, you know, we've done a lot to build systems to help both sides and we are pretty proud of that. It's interesting if you think about open source, where it's come from. I mean, I remember the days when open source wasn't open. I would be peddling software. Hey, it's a free copy of Unix um, in college. And now it's all free. But I mean, just what's changed now, it used to be just free software. Download software, you got it. Now it's a service. Service now can be monetized quickly. And what you guys are offering with AWS and cloud scale is you've done all these things as you know, I don't have to if I'm a developer. I yeah. get the benefits of the scale. I can bring my open source code to the table, make it a service, integrate it in with other services and be the next snowflake, be the next you know, uh, company that could scale. And that is, that's, the, that's the innovation, right? That's the, yeah. This is a new phenomenon. So it also changes the business model. So, yeah, I, actually you're, you're quite right. I actually, I, I'll add one more thing to it. If you look at how a lot of enterprises use containers today, most of them are using something like ECS and Fargate or to EKS to build an internal developer platform and uh, internal developer portal. And then the question then becomes is how do you scale this modern development practices to an entire organization? What if you're a big bank that's been around as thousands and thousands of IT staff that may not all be experts at running Kubernetes or running containers, how do you scale it out? Uh, that's where systems like Proton come into play. That was actually the inspiration is how do you help an organization where they're building these developer portals and developer infrastructure, uh, developer platforms and how do you make it A, easy for them to build it, B, almost use it as a way to get these modern practices into the hands of all the business units, where they may or not have the time to become experts at the modern ways of running infrastructure because they're busy doing other things. And I think you'll see a lot more happen in that space. There's stuff happening in the open source community, there's Proton, there's a bunch of interesting things happening here. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And, and also, you know, the communal, the communal aspect of not just writing code together, but succeeding, right, building yeah. something. I mean, that's when you start to see the commercial meets open kind of ethos of communal activity of working together and sharing. A big part of this year's DockerCon is sharing, not just running yeah. and shipping a code, yeah. but sharing. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, uh, Docker's original value was you build, run and ship, right? You, you use the same code to build it, you use the same code to ship it, same sort of in, infrastructure interface, and then you run it and that, you know, the fact that the Docker image is such a wonderfully shareable entity uh, and that can run everywhere is, is such a powerful, I mean, so it's, it's, called, it's an OCI image now. I still call them Docker images uh, because it's just easier. Yeah. But that, to me, like that is a big deal. And it, I think it's becoming an, become an even bigger deal over the years. Uh, like I came from, some, you know, before Amazon, I used to work in the sciences and bioinformatics and, you know, the ability to share code, share dependencies and package all of that up in a container image is a big deal. Uh, it's what got me, one of the reasons I got fascinated with containers seven, eight years ago. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see where all of this goes. It's great, great stuff, great success. And congratulations Deepak, great to always talk to you. Got a great finger on the pulse. You lead a really important organization at AWS and you know, Docker has such huge success with developers, even though the company has gone through kind of a, a, a changeover and a pivot to what they're doing now, they're back to their open source roots, but they have millions and millions of developers use Docker and new developers are coming in. .NET developers are coming in. Windows yeah. developers are coming in. And, and so it's no longer about Linux anymore. It's about just coding. Yeah. Big trend. And, 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 it's, and it's part of this big trend 
towards infrastructure automation and and you know development and deployment practices that I think everyone is going to adopt faster than we think they will. But you know, companies like Docker and the open source projects that they're involved in are critical in making that a lot easier for them. And then you know, folks like us get to build on top of that and or with them and make it even easier. Well, great uh, testimony to Docker that you guys based your ECS on Docker. Docker has a critical role in the developer community by Run, Compose, and their hub with Docker Desktop. And we'll be watching Amazon and, and the community activity and see what kind of experiences you guys can bring to the table and continue that momentum. Thank you, Deepak, for coming on theCUBE. Oh, thank you, John. It's always a pleasure. Okay, this is theCUBE's DockerCon 2021 virtual coverage. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.